Sure, so uh, it's good to see you all here. I even see some familiar faces from our very recent trips, but we'll say more about them. Uh, tonight, our lecturers are uh, Calvin Sow and Zach McGowan of Sow McGowan. It's a, a New York-based architectural firm that was started in 1985. Uh, and uh, Zach and Calvin met in graduate school and then started the firm. So you all have the potential. Look to your right, look to your left. This is somebody who you can start a, a firm with. It's true, and it can last for something like 35 years, which is, um, which is amazing. And as the website of Sal McGowan says, the architecture ranges from urban plans, homes, office complexes, museums, interiors, furniture, bathtubs, table settings, and lipstick. I think this is the first time we've had a lecturer who, who actually has lipstick, or at least has it in print. Um, and what, what caught my eye, though, was this phrase, the big and the small are to us equally compelling. And I think it's a kind of remarkable way of thinking about how we operate as, um, as architects. And I see this in their work from the scale of a molding, which is kind of purposely blown out in a very mannered way, in an east side um, townhouse with the sides of it sheared so you just read the profile, almost like a uh, kind of Hollywood Regency, <laughs> but minimally, uh, minimally done, to the skyscraper that many of you have seen, the Beaver House, which was done for Andre Balaz, the hotelier. Um, it's actually this, that's that great uh, yellow and black uh, building in lower Manhattan with a great uh, penthouse and sky room done in glazed yellow uh, brick from which you can view the city. And from the, this most kind of secular project on Wall Street to work in Bhutan for an elder sanctuary. This represents a range of engagement that we don't ordinarily see in practices, and in fact, Sal McCown is an international practice. So it's about the local and the global in, uh, in its idea and fact. Both Calvin and Zach are involved in the culture of architecture as well. Calvin was the, the uh, vice president of design excellence at New York AIA and the past president of the Architectural League in New York. Uh, he's taught at uh, Cooper Union, Parsons, and the GSD. Uh, Zach McGowan co-founded uh, Design New York City that helps nonprofits uh, who are in need of design services. They're both recipients of the Cooper Hewitt National Design Award and have been inducted into the Interior Design Hall of Fame. We all are, are lucky to have uh, both uh, Calvin and Zach teaching for us along with John G. We, you know, we actually have this whole design team that we import from New York. And part of this team was recently in China. We're in uh, Dalian and Shanghai. And where is, I see this smatterings of students. Raise your hands if you were just in China in the past week. Good. Good. And uh, that should include uh, Randall Corman as well, who uh, was along to make sure that we didn't get into any big trouble uh, as we were wandering through the streets. And I've been to Shanghai before, but I have to say, um, walking the streets with Calvin was this great kind of architectural derive, discovering these lilongs, discovering the specific morphologies of the city in Shanghai, uh, looking at the older traditional fabric, what remains of it, and the new uh, shopping development, and to understand how this formal uh, uh, kind of property of the city gets translated into a kind of political and social realm. In four days, or in the four days that I was there, we met with uh, two deans, at least one other real estate develop, uh, developer, the local design uh, institute, which is the local architect that gets work built, that was in uh, Dalian, with a vice mayor, uh, and we were in formal receptions, private dining rooms, even CCTV reporters who followed the project that um, our students were doing with um, Sao McCown in, uh, in Dalian. Students had shirts made and shopped 
and shopped um, for new Chinese porcelain and ate everything from French fries at simulacra of coffee shops to sushi to soup dumplings, which were in fact incredible. And then they visited the site and did site analysis in Dalian on what will be uh, a development of about a million point seven five square feet, uh, mixed use, looking specifically at uh, how this large scale project can develop an authentic urbanity and uh, reuse a piece of urban fabric, an old school which sits on the site, and in rapid growth cities like Dalian, like many cities worldwide and certainly in China, this is an important uh, issue. You know, when you know people in a specific way, I've known Calvin and Zach uh, for years and years in New York, and seeing them on the road, seeing them in the studio, you get to know uh, people uh, or you get to know things which are, are different. And uh, what I've come to learn is Calvin and Zach's intellectual generosity and the breadth of their teaching. Their interest in scale shifts, the construction of a jacket is as much of interest as a porcelain table setting and deserves the same level of craft as a curtain wall. And what they also stress is the ability to converse across disciplines and culture. Their commitment is really to architecture as a project and a cultural art form. So I'd like to welcome them both uh, to come and speak tonight. And thank you very much. That was our lecture. <laughs> Mark, you took all the words out of our mouths. Um, well, both Zach and I thank your dean and your associate dean and everyone here on a very warm night. If I were you, I'd be out there lying on the lawn, but so I really appreciate you coming in. Um, I guess we should start by asking the question, why the name of this, this lecture, Serving Conscience? And as you know, we, we spend our lives trying to understand, comprehend the nature of right and wrong, and figure out a code of ethics for ourselves to situate the individual into the communal. And uh, as an architect, I think we have an added responsibility because we're doing it on behalf of many, many people. And so not only we have to, to uh, constantly review what conscience, what right and wrong is for ourselves, we're doing it on behalf of other people. So, um, Zach, you were gonna say something. Well, just a little bit more on that. Um, as Mark mentioned, our work uh, sort of runs the gamut. And um, part of why we've actually wanted from the beginning to have such a varied practice and, and explore so many different types of projects is that is relates to what Calvin was just saying about you know, needing to, I mean, as, as a writer is advised in school by all his mentors, you know, write about what you know. Um, we know the wisdom of that. Um, as, as Shakespeare advised, uh, to, thine, to thine own self be true, we know the wisdom of that. But we know that as architects, it's not only ourselves that we have to know, that's the start. We have to know much, much more because our work affects so many more people than just ourselves. And so just as we all learn in school by doing, we have uh, just taken that method and we continue to learn by doing these various projects. So it's, it's a journey. So charity begins at home. Yeah. As we know, we, we work so long, long hours. So this is our office. A lot of areas to lounge and hang out and cry and have a nervous breakdown. Uh, that is our view. Which helps. <laughs> which helps us link us to the world out there. We know every weather, every turn of the climate. And this is our people. We actually limit ourselves to be no, long, no more than 40 people ever. Because beyond that, we feel we've been big. We had an office in Singapore. Um, and we, of course, now beginning to develop something in China as, a, as, a, as a, a place of liaison. But in terms of our own studio, where we generate our thoughts, 
we really want to have created an intimate environment and we feel that more than 40 people is way too big to have that personal relationship with each other. And of course we do, like everyone else, we charrette and work hard, but we also have fun. And that's really important. This is our pie day where every year we make bake pies. We actually learn to understand each other better through that personality through making pies. Some are very sweet and thick and luscious, others are very minimal. We really know how to read our staff and our team <laughs> through pies. And of course we have pet days, we have pool days. <laughs> now you wonder whether we ever work. And of course we always celebrate an end of a charrette. Um, okay, so I think the we wanted to start with, as, as Mark said, big and small. The first shelter is actually clothing. And, uh, and we were lucky to create a collection. It didn't last very long. It's a very difficult business. But we did start thinking about clothing um, and its relationship to, to resources and identity. And you know, looking at Japanese kimonos and Chinese robes, in fact, there was no tailoring, and every, every inch, every, there's no scrap from tailoring. And so we started looking at new ways of creating clothing with that kind of model. So these are all basically uh, fat, uh, flat pieces of fabric, no cutting. You just talk about just stitching, and the result is that. Um, now these, uh, of course, because of the flatness of these cuts, they're very, they do get a very kind of Asian feel. And so we start thinking, well, what happens if we're taking Western clothing, ruffles and, and, and darts and tailoring, and still not waste any fabric? And so we explore with different materiality of fabric, such as uh, bias or stretch. And this is done with wool jersey, which has a great stretch to it. And just take one piece of fabric, two, oops, wrong thing. Um, just two slots on each side for sleeves, like here. And then just basically tracing the section. Now this is a very architectural thing to do to fashion. Talk about section cuts. A section of the body darts for bust, and then a zipper is placed right down the middle. And voila, you get a dress with all the Western features of a, a ruffle um, and, and, and uh, waistline and so on, and still not a scrap of waste. Then we had an opportunity to design a line of tabletops, and the first thing that came to my mind is, I'm, we went to a tabletop showroom, and there were more patterns you can shake a stick at. Endless shapes, patterns. And we thought, OK, the world doesn't need another pattern. But we have changed the way we, we eat now. And in an increasingly globalizing cuisine, uh, and why are we sticking to a five-piece set of a teacup, which who drinks? You drink tea. but. Uh, <laughs> You know, but we drink gallons of liquid. So a little demi tasse simply is just a conceit. Uh, and, uh, and the five place setting, if you don't know, is like a little, you know, a salad plate, a dessert plate, a dinner to plate, and a soup bowl and a teacup. So we rethought this, trying to look at different cuisines, and we ended up with just going to the factory and picking up from their archives typical, the nicest looking generic coffee mug, a rice bowl, a larger, what they call a Japanese udon noodle bowl, uh, a super uh, buffet platter, and a regular dish, a, a plate, a nine inch plate. And so it's reconfiguring what's already there. Don't reinvent the wheel but recombine to create new. And the only thing we did was combining these plates, which are not meant, uh, you know, vessels not meant to be put together, 
into a new five set piece pattern that addresses the way we eat, either having a sandwich or a bowl of ice cream or cereal or soup or Japanese noodles, um, but always with a big cup of something. Um, and the next is actually furniture we made for a, a library project in, in, in New York with a very tight budget, but we really had an opportunity to talk about behavior and furniture, how one can in relate to each other. The conventions of chairs, sofas, divans, and how we sit. And especially with children who normally just get small, reduced, you know, diminished versions, miniature versions of uh, adult furniture. So we're not thinking, we actually worked with the children to look at the way they, they behave and created these very simple kit of parts for them to, to write, to draw, to scribble, to jump around, to throw. Um, and then when we were confronted with creating a, a lot of fixtures for our retail projects, again, looking at conservation, why waste material? And so this is actually pre-laser cut. It's quite tediously done. Uh, now it'll be very easy. It's a piece of metal with these shapes cut out, folded down into shelves. And, uh, sometimes we even don't do anything at all, but just appropriate. These are egg sorters from the flea market that's been turned into a, a light fixture. And then other times light fixtures are collaboration between craftspeople and ourselves. Um, these are shapes that we've, we gave to Thai uh, craftspeople. It's a project in, in Thailand, of course, and they just use what's uh, material available there with lots of seashells and turn, it, turn this into a wall sconce. This is the infamous lipstick. Um, it actually took a year and a half to develop this lipstick, during which time we actually created a project in China and was built. <laughs> um, <laughs> I <kid you> not. <laughs> and the amazing thing is, of course, it's developed for a Japanese company, and they, they are very deliberate. There's almost the opposite of the Chinese. Uh, speed is less important than perfection. And we were asked to, to, to create a, 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 a packaging, and we combined two observations, one which is the the, the product before you buy it, and then the product after you buy it. So before you buy it, how do you display the product so that people can really uh, choose and also, of course, create what they call shelf appeal? Um, but at the same time, of course, we've noticed with our lady friends that after dinner, they're constantly fumbling through their purses to find an assortment of lipsticks, all in different brands, and they couldn't figure out which one. It's always opening one up and go, oh no, wrong color, that's the lip gloss. And we thought, well, you know, why don't we keep it simple and just make it transparent? Very obvious solution, really. Um, so that when, you, when you're in the store, it's easy to display all the colors. You don't have to use a, a chart. And then when you're in your purse, same thing. You reach in, you know exactly what color you have. Uh, strangely enough, easier said than done, because techno technologically, uh, the, the, the case was there to hide a million conceits and sins and mechanisms, and to expose them. In fact, the, the factories have to retool all the, uh, um, all the machinery so that they can inject the, the, the lip color into it without messing it up, and without normally what they would have is a metal cap that uh, they, the machine grabs and inserts into the, the, uh, the case. And so we're really grateful that the company really went with it, and here it is. Um, before we go into projects, which is what I want to talk about, a couple of things that really ultimately are very important to us. Uh, light, without light we cannot see, without cannot see we cannot really experience too many things. So natural and artificial light is really the, the, the first base that we have to 
look at. So here we're looking at artificial light in its relationship to sh form and space and surface. Uh, and then again, exploring the mix of the two, natural and artificial light, and how they, they complement and work with each other. Uh, or just natural light on surfaces and using it to create uh, atmosphere even, if not visibility. Um, or light as volumes itself. Or here's that picture <laughs> that you mentioned, that ho Hollywood yes, slash, yeah, Hollywood Regency, um, where as you can see how light really can can play off of whatever you do if you work with it. Uh, or you harness it, in this case, it's a very large building where n we felt no amount of architectural bravura or decoration can really animate the space. So we prayed to Mother Nature and harnessed light. And as you know, light during the course of the day, weather systems, constantly changing and creating a dynamic experience in an otherwise static space. What is the project? Uh, it's, we're going to actually talk about it a little later. It's called Centex City. It's in Singapore. It's at a convention center. Uh, movement, in this case, say, st staircases, how it can be both movement physicalized it's a figure, but of course it is a mechanism, a device to help you move through space. You can look at it, you can experience it uh, in all its myriad different configurations. And then we're moving on to actual architecture or interior architecture. Or decorating. No, <laughs> sorry, Zach, it's your turn. Okay. Um, <clears throat> this is um, a loft in a, in a very busy part of downtown New York, um, former factory conversion. The, um, the very, very, very busy streets outside, and, uh, and the main thing that we want to talk about here is, is this creation of the, um, the top, top, top. Uh, top of this thick zone here, um, which is a kind of, well, it's, it's an interstitial space between um, the, the interior and the, and, the, uh, and the urban space beyond. Um, it's a buffer, it's a, it's a sound uh, buffer. It's, it's, a, it's a thickening of the wall where there was actually almost no wall because it's a, a steel frame building. And, um, and it's an opportunity to, uh, here the shades are closed, but it's an opportunity to experience the outdoors from this safe perch as opposed to just walking up to the window. It's also a thick zone for storing things and for um, other things like. Uh, well, it, it also yeah. kind yeah. of uh, accentuates the relationship between personal and urban space. Yeah. And also to, to create a special experience uh, of that, uh, of that relationship. And it's also, of course, um, uh, creating a sort of safe, safe zone in a way. And most of our work does always focus on these kind of polarities inside interiority, exteriority, urban, personal. And so in this project, it's just really, I mean, we're gonna talk about other parts of it. The most important part is this, this thickening of that experience through this, um, this particular move. <coughs> Next is um, a townhouse of, uh, with a classical plan that you saw the stair earlier. We peered up this same stair. Um, and the, this building doesn't, it had been gutted previously. It was 10 apartments. We were converting it back to one residence. And, um, but the, this building doesn't really lend itself to anything much other than a classical plan, especially when there's such an exquisite stair to preserve. And, um, and so, but we did explore some nuances of uh, elements such as you know, moldings, which serve a purpose for defining space, working with light and shadow and, 
but they don't have to be um, of the very you know, specific type that we've known before. Um, the, the pillowing of the stone, the it playing with the scale in unexpected ways, it bringing together elements that um, of comfort, really, that we know well, such as the moldings, different types of furniture, in this case, combination of the owners and things that, that we introduced. Uh, developing new pieces, uh, in this case, working with some of the owners' uh, fantasies of, uh, of flowers, um, or working you know, with this privileged person's fantasies of, of butterflies. It's, it's well, uh, what is important yeah. is that when you intersect with different classes of people, different stratum of society. Uh, when you understand where they're coming from, they offer you opportunity to explore very different facets of the human imagination. Um, and some could be whimsical and maybe even silly. Um, and in this case, we, and, but it allows us to explore different craft, like finding different materials and sending it to India and having and butterflies embroidered and then fabricated into wall coverings and, and, and headboards. Now, this is not architectural, but I think it is about creating an environment, yeah, so of which I think uh, architecture is certainly a, a part of. But you know, going on to that building, it's not because of just there alone, I believe, but that leaving things well enough alone is just as important as the urge to innovate and when you have a building on the Upper East Side, which is perfectly fine, the only thing is that they had been downgraded to a multiple dwelling and badly done, uh, some pop people maybe see it as an opportunity, as a canvas to start uh, creating a statement. But we saw instead an opportunity to honor whatever the, the, the historical context and build on that rather than in contrast to the existing material. And you know, since talking about conscience and right and wrong, most of these explanations, even as we talk about the details, I, I think that we do want, wish that you all ponder about the strategies, why we do certain things, why do we think this is right. I'm not thinking it's saying it's universal right and wrong, but that's what we feel serves what we believe be the right thing to do. So on the other <coughs> side, now that we've served the, the privileged Manhattanite, we're looking at a project in Queens for uh, recent immigrants, and it's, uh, there's children. It's a it's library. A, it's, that, a, uh, it's a conversion of uh, two classrooms in a public school, K through five, um, which was this. Um, and um, with a, a low budget, working with Robin Hood Foundation, but having um, the opportunity to completely examine and redefine programmatically what is library today. Um, working with, uh, it was fascinating for me working with certain experts who had very, it seemed to me, very fixed ideas about everything was now suddenly about group learning and, uh, and responding to my conscience, pushing back and saying, well, what I remember most are the individual discoveries in the library that uh, were sort of shocking and wonderful. Um, and and uh, in, in the end, being able to accommodate both, um, both keeping the carols that you see on the left in this early uh, scheme, and, uh, and also introducing an icon, a sort of tower of books, and turning one group a learning area into a kind of uh, stage. Um, you saw this furniture earlier, in an earlier slide there. It's, it's just two pieces, one that flips to become, it's identical piece, two different sizes. It serves as seat and desk for children of all sizes from six to 13. And, uh, and you know, this is more or less how we imagine them being used and, and we were fascinated by this combination that the children came up with themselves. But it was part of creating furniture, as Calvin mentioned earlier, that they would engage. And uh, the, the design itself was, we very much had in mind to make it very simple, exposing the mechanisms, the strategies for how it's put together so they could very easily reverse engineer it and be stimulated by Well, that, we did uh, put in cues for how yeah. they can innovate. I mean, yeah. this kind of inter uh, um, interactive 
conditions that we want to impregnate in our work, uh, even on something very sim simple, I think is the key. It's not all about um, creating new, uh, new forms. It's creating the context where interaction and engagement can happen. And they did like it. <laughs> and um, well, the next scale yeah. is our houses. Um, we're showing two. One, this house is actually. I mean, it's a real privilege to these days to to have a, to have a, so much carbon footprint, I suppose. Um, and uh, so how how we can make the most of it. So we explore in this, in this how it's a relationship, the fam, the re, how to organize a family relationship and also organize the relationship of the house to the landscape. And it's generally done by organizing them around two courtyards. Um, the one courtyard, um, this courtyard with the landscape, and then this interior courtyard, kind of recalling the uh, Chinese four season courtyard, which co organize, organizing the re organizes the relationship between uh, the members of the family. So this is the parents' wing, and these are the children's wing. This is a family room with kitchen, and that's the, a, a more formal living room. And then the dining, the congregation of, of dining, being the symbolic heart of the house. Um, and then, and then this op double height space with a stair slashing through it allows all these um, rooms and these people to retreat into their safety of their own room, uh, secure their own room, but very easily accessible visually and, or, and audially um, into that space. So they, there's a kind of both communal and private. Uh, reconciliation. And so you know, this is the courtyard made by the building and the garden. And this is the, the interior space where the, the children's wing here and the parents wing is there and the dining space here. That's another dining room. Looking back to the, the, the bedroom and then to the living space. And then again, on, as a sub-theme, always the transparency and the accessibility between the inside and the outside. And this is other house, uh, is actually a conceptual house. It's part of an exercise called the Sagaponic Project where 35 architects were invited to ponder uh, the future of the domestic landscape in American culture. And what we observe is that we are living in an age of ambivalence, and that we shun the McMansion, and yet we are busting over with lots of needs for space. We need a rec room, we need a this, we need a that. And, uh, and so how do we reconcile a small, a small looking house with a big program? Uh, we've, we've, we quite often understand the parents want to have a, you know, a very close relationship with children, and yet they need to have private space. Uh, we, we observe that people want to be uh, very, again, very private, but then they also want to, to show who they are in the neighborhood. Um, so all these kind of polarities, now rather than saying, well, which one is right and wrong, we realize, we just acknowledge that ambivalence is part of our consciousness and can we actually reconcile? Can we have our cake and eat it? So this has become an exploration of that theme. Um, so what we did 
here was the house is divided into, it's kind of bipolar, I guess, as a result. A, a house on the ground, which is a 32 by 32 by 32 cube, and it houses a, the master and all the public living, dining, and kitchen spaces. And then there is a subterranean uh, program that, that um, creeps out beyond the footprint here. So here's the, the main house, very small. It's situated in an axis, which is actually uh, defined by uh, a, a true north-south. And actually, it's uh, another layer of uh, most people who would be living in this house is mostly Manhattanites. And we want to create a dialogue with orientation, natural orientation of Manhattan with this. So uh, the, 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 the main house is oriented to the Manhattan grid, and the actual underground house is oriented to the true north-south, uh, or the magnetic north-south. Um, and under this cross are a series of functions uh, that has the guest room or the in-laws room, garages, children's room, and another kitchen slash party rec room, TV room, so on, that opens out onto a pool. Now this is the messy part of the house. This is the more kind of uh, parlor uh, guest part of the house. This, as you see from the street, and with the ingress, and finally the whole back side of the house, which reveals its conceit of being a very small house. Uh, and so this all opens, so it filters out to the pool. Uh, it is also, and as a side, a kind of dialogue about Baroque and modern, uh, and what does it mean? So stylistically, seemingly modern, but it has certain Baroque flourishes. And we feel that, again, in this mitigating uh, mentality that we can reconcile f fantasy with something much more sober. And so this room, for example, you can open the door and wake up and run lap, swim laps, go to the other side. And there's actually a series of rain showers. So very decadent, sybaritic, and that's just fine. And then the other parts may be very organized and rational. Uh, so rational, irrational gets thrown into the, the mix of polarity. Um, let me see. The parlor, and then the rec room with its open kitchen, and you can take the bicycle in, it rolls right out. Um, this this is um, right? your turn. Yeah. Okay. Um, I guess that's the advance. Um, <clears throat> this is a hotel in, the, in actually in, in Bangkok in the in the garden in the center of town. It was um, an atrium hotel that we complete got renovation and um, the issues. Actually, we realized pretty soon was similar to the issues that one would encounter in uh, in urban planning, urban design. The issues of privacy, uh, public to private to you know, semi-private to more private. Um, biggest obvious issue in an atrium hotel is just coming out of your room, and suddenly you are in a very public space. So we addressed that with these um, these these uh, screens of uh, of crystals and. Um, and also with the, the glass, which uh, both allows the, the spaciousness to read and, and still affords uh, privacy. Um, and then the, um, and, and on each floor also starting to introduce some, some smaller some spaces that are smaller nodes that, that are on, all on one's way to the larger nodes, the public square here, the lobby. And uh, which connects to another square, if you will, which is um, a, a restaurant at the lower level that opens out onto the garden. From there, you look back up to the, the lobby level. Um, and uh, 
and then hidden away, as you would hope to find in, in any city, uh, little surprises like, like this uh, cafe, which um, by day has, has one uh, character and by night uh, has yet another. Um, and um, how would you introduce this one? Well, um, the earlier one, which was introducing the urbanity into the interior spaces. And, uh, and, he, and looking at the appropriateness of, of the context of, of cities. Now, look, going back to the, out, the broader context of, of urbanity, what is the identity of a neighborhood? And here we are in Tribeca. It's a neighborhood that not, does not want to broadcast its presence. It's a very private uh, quarter in New York. And after much soul searching, we just felt it of right to not create a building that stands out uh, as a symbol. And it's a residential building, it, so we uh, def deferred, um, deferred the, the, the style yeah. To, yeah. to something that integrates with the neighboring context. Uh, of course, as always, we simplify, we, we distill things to essentials, um, and, and creating an architecture that has a double reading of being seemingly always been there, but upon closer inspection, you realize uh, it is a contemporary uh, uh, production. Yeah. And then now, the, the, the one that Mark had mentioned, is the other, which is in the dense, anonymous downtown of Wall Street. You live in a building, you almost want to shout, look at me, I'm here. I'm here, there, look at me. You yeah. know. So we, we wanted to create an identity for this building that people could say, I live in the yellow building downtown on Wall Street. Everyone knows exactly where it is. And so it's looking at iconography, not in the form of sculpture, or, uh, but in in, in its color only. Now that, that is uh, something of a signifier in an in a, in a urban uh, landscape and topography, but when it comes down to the street level, it's a whole different kind of consideration. There, we want to open this, the building up uh, to take advantage of the one lone open space, which is Hanover, Hanover Square across the street, and, uh, and invite the city into the building. And also, again, like Nylert, uh, where we created a city, a, a village within the city, we invited the city into the building, but not as an urbanity itself, but rather as a, a series of events that animates the community of this building as a whole. And so the, the, the two-story, two-level lobby comprises of libraries, gymnasiums, swimming pools, a covered dog run, yoga, screening room, party room, etc. Et so that it has actually a sort of independence all its own. Um, and, and with a great deal of transparency and engagement of the street, which uh, we thought was very important, especially in this part of downtown where there are few residential buildings. And uh, although by day it's thronged, by night they're quiet. And, uh, and it's a kind of neighborliness that we learned in our travels from places like Amsterdam, <laughs> where I understand in Amsterdam, if anyone here knows it well, can tell me if this is true, that it's good neighbor, you're a good neighbor if you keep your shades open, um, and not if you don't. So these are the various components. And then there's, this is the infamous rooftop. Now this is more interesting as a, as a kind of play on economics, because normally, this would be a yet another apartment for sale. But working out on functionality and 
and the sort of creating a, a script for how people would live there, combined with the fact that most of those apartments are fairly small in size, we're able to convince the client that if we left this unit out and created a community penthouse space, they could actually sell those apartments for $20 more per square foot and make it back, and it becomes a feature. So this point is not so much, it is really made to say that actually what we're educated is not just form making or, or involved in just aesthetics and the language that is architecture alone. It's a way of organizing um, thought, logic, re uh, rationality, and, uh, and we can apply that, that mastermind manner to all kinds of problem solving. And, and this is an illustration where in solving an economic and market-driven uh, issue actually allows us to do what we do best in, 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 in design. Um, now we talked about the earlier two, which is uh, disappearing into the city and shouting from the city. And now we're looking at a project in China where a, city, a, a building might even be a catalyst for social uh, change. And this is a town of Qingdao. Uh, there is an old part of town. And then there is a new CBD, which is a central business district that was developed about 15 years ago where they were just busy to throw something together. Then now it's littered with buildings that are badly done and not very programmatic or relevant even. And so we, with this site, we're trying to pull the entire context of the city old and new together. The old is actually built by the Germans about a century ago. It's low rise. It's residential. And then this new CBD, which needs to be replaced and is shifting to this area. And we're the first building to, to, to sound uh, the bell to say that this is our new symbol of this city. So the pressure now is a building that has to be truly iconic. Now, we don't take that lightly because building is icon, it's a dime a dozen. Um, so we look to the nature of icon. Now, in Chinese, in Confucius thought, um, this is what they call a scholar rock. Uh, and the other one is a rock, the one in the middle is a rock, of, uh, is a rock in a, a sutra or garden. And it's clearly uh, man intervened, or you know, man made. Uh, I mean, this is not, not that. Um, and why isolate a piece of nature in such an artificial context? The point is to delineate the nature of human intervention and nature itself. And it's called the scholar's rock because scholars, who are the leaders in philosophical thinking, they would place these rocks in their study to ponder the, the, mean, the metaphysical and, and existential. Uh, and the nature of how we exist in this world. Uh, and all with all its complexities, contradictions, ironies, and hopefully finding the middle way, as they call it. And, and this is a, a phenomenon that is more widely understood in China than we can imagine, uh, so, such mythology. So now we felt that we could probably translate and blow up the scale of contemplation to that of a building, that the building itself is like a scholar's rock. We made it, it's made of nature. We forged nature into the image that we see ourselves as. And what is the meaning? And so this icon, this building is deliberately mysterious. It doesn't have any signifiers to say I'm, you know, have a big, bat, big classical hat on or I'm not a modern plinth, but it's a, a reflected crystal uh, which 
sometimes defies nature because it's cut, undercut, um, sitting on a plinth. And it invites you to question the, the very meaning of its existence. Now, flip-flopping back from creating an icon to preservation, this is a corner of the Forbidden City in Beijing. And we're asked to, to restore this corner along with preservationists. And we saw an opportunity here, since this is a site, it's been, it was a site burned down uh, during the Qing Dynasty. And we saw an opportunity to, uh, and, and this is how it was before it was burned down. We had no documentation, so we actually created, recreated the building from paintings and descriptions in letter, literary accounts. But we saw an opportunity to use this uh, project to re resuscitate some existing, uh, some ancient crafts that are dying. Um, and uh, this is still, in many ways, the way buildings are built. Uh, and so we just stay that way in a very low tech, very crafted way. We we use the ancient measurement of the hand rather than uh, a metric or, of course, an imperial scale is out of the question. Uh, we're able to use this uh, ambitious projects to, to bring old master masons and wood carvers to teach younger generations. Um, we have to, of course, entertain their work habits or encourage the young, inspired by uh, historical materials, which I can't believe the archives are kept that way, but this is the <coughs> Forbidden City Imperial Palace. Can you imagine? That's the archive. Uh, so we use those as inspiration and created new models for it. And then and then there comes a dichotomy of now what do you do with these buildings and exteriors built exactly as it was before. It is to find new functions for it and we work with the, the palace museum officials to determine finally that it would be best used as a uh, guest reception as well as a temporary exhibition space. But that meant that we did not recreate the interiors. And so, in so doing, we decided to leave the interior entirely blank, left up to a level of construction. This is actually the state of, of, the, of construction before they apply this polychrome. And this is a kind of a waterproofing that they apply to everything. And it turns out to be this kind of strangely modern white. Um, and so we just left it. So sometimes, what I'm saying is that, again, leave everything well enough alone and just to say, stop, leave it just now. And, um, and that's the only intervention we make, say stop, don't do any further. Well, except for the staring. No, I mean that picture. Yeah, yeah. Now, of course, here, <laughs> in, <laughs> except for the staring. Except for the staring. So then we have to get up somewhere and, uh, and there's no actually models for stairs back in the day. They, yeah. The, the, we, they didn't go upstairs, it was actually sealed off, and you got up in a ladder to use it as a storeroom. So we did fabricate the stair. We, we of course, floated the floor so that in the future, if they want to re yeah. restore the floor, the ground, the foundation, they can just lift this wood floor uh, off. Gl glimpses of the ruin that are visible, and that those reveals around the columns. And then this, uh, stair inserted in this space. And we deliberately contrasted it volumetrically away from the existing material, so there's no way you can confuse one for the other. Although it doesn't, we couldn't help but 
being inspired by some of the flourishes. This is a handrail. And it is this tube that you start downstairs and you end up on the top floor with the, the roof exposed where historically it would have been covered. And but from there, yes. there, there are views of the Forbidden City that weren't really available from anywhere else, so it was uh, such so irresistible. Yeah. So then <coughs> moving to the west, this is the city of Budapest. And in this case, the, the, what we're proposing is, in fact, uh, stalling. <laughs> uh, as you know, the, city, the Buda, uh, Hungary, the all Eastern Europe, is trying to re revive itself economically. Not so great. They needed to. They're stuck between trying to generate some economic revival. They they were trying to. So what they did was tr restore or renovate or rebuild in the inner city, but not well. And some of the beautiful old buildings are now savagely being ripped apart in the name of restoration. And so when we were invited uh, for a conference there, we, we suggested to the government that maybe they should leave the inner city well enough alone uh, at this moment and not touch it until you're ready to touch it once and for all. And yet they still needed an impetus and some infrastructure to uh, start their economic revival. So we, at their invitation, we, uh, and this is the existing, and uh, you see they're, they're you know, putting, well, that's not so bad, but there are some very inappropriate um, additions throughout. So we suggested that actually there's an area around an old power station near the university which is actually, uh, when we did some studies, uh, were very great, uh, appropriate, right on the periphery of this old Buddha side, and it's right on the water. And uh, the networks of uh, railways and highways uh, converge very close to this without congesting the city, old city, and road networks, and rail networks ferry networks all find this site very favorable, this site here. Um, the metro also goes very close to it. Here's a site. This is the old Buddha and the Pesh side. And uh, this is a central artery. Anything on this side is very, very old and preserved. Um, so we're suggesting that they actually create an incremental development over 10 years on this site. And we looked at the neighborhood context, of course, uh, redirecting some of the roads. Uh, we started to create a, set, a series of hierarchical arteries. Um, the pink is the most traffic. The red is, uh, the, 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 is actually more pedestrian effort, is access. And, and th this road is actually also uh, a, um, a semi dense road that takes you to the university. <coughs> and we looked at all the different roads, and then de 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 designed the nature of these roads. And red parts, and I want to show most of them, but here are just two. This one and that one are these. And then looked at these various areas and see what one could do incrementally, like creating a temporary water park. I know it's tacky, but you know, um, for children and so on. And it's in, these are kind of like carnivals that you can bring in and, and then you can take out. So bring some life into this, uh, this areas to create an awareness for the city first before anything is built, farmer's market, anything to enliven this otherwise dead area. Now this area actually has an amazing, oh, I'm sorry. And of course, looking at then all the other areas, well, what might happen along the waterfront. Um, 
and then started looking at different uh, types, like these are commercial buildings uh, that might be live work in nature, uh, residential, then wrap around there, and then more another kind of housing in this site. But all this is actually uh, made doable because there is a really amazing abandoned power station here that uh, we're allowed to restore and turn it into something that we're very familiar with here, which is like Soho or Chelsea or in Beijing, there's an area called 798 and it's really uh, a live work place, a gallery space for artists. This is the building and uh, the in in its interiors have <coughs> a tremendous amount of character and it has a uh, crowning space, the control center for power station, which is one of the most amazing spaces I've seen in a while. So of course this will be preserved and uh, and so what we're proposing is first restore that building, bring the artists in. We all we know that trick. You bring the artists in, the energy goes, comes. Then phase one are these uh, re, uh, recreational facilities. That's the power station surrounding live, uh, artist lofts, creating a series of very modest pavilions along the water, re restore the, 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 the water, qual water quality here and then creating a, extend the park into this, into this site and creating a, a sort of uh, entertainment or recreational pavilions. Then the phase two is creating uh, commercial spaces, hot hotels, uh, work, uh, live work spaces. Then um, uh, extension, then a larger uh, conference center and then finally, uh, bringing uh, the, the residential density up. And that would be the final build out in 10 years. Of course, at this point, we, who knows with their economy, it's on hold, but I take great hope that that building at least will be restored. Yeah. <coughs> and something of a very different uh, nature about, I think it was four years ago when the issue of the border fence was sort of white hot politically. A, an editor at the New York Times um, asked four or five architects to design a border fence, show us what you would do. And um, Calvin and I both had a, this, this uh, thought, well that's, that's, of course that doesn't make any sense. And uh, the last thing that one wants to do is is to you know, to build reinforce the penitentiary like aspects of the of the of the border, but but why do the Mexicans come here, leave their homes, leave their families? Obviously, it's for work. Why not take models that we've seen elsewhere in the world, such as in Shenzhen next to Hong Kong, where there's special economic zones? Do whatever that one can do to really make it thrive economically, make it an attraction, make it a a place where there's a uh, a density of activities and economic, uh, uh, they just so it would thrive. And, and, um, and so, you know, the people always talk about how from the space you see the Great Wall of China, which we know did not keep out the, uh, the invading, uh, invading Mongolian hordes. Uh, but, uh, but this you would see from space just as a, a bright light of, uh, of activities that are moving things in the right direction. So it's another way of thinking. It. It's it's design. It's well, it's a, it's a, it becomes a kind of a th thickening, uh, and and also coming together of, of two countries, uh, two two cultures, two economies. So instead of repelling, it becomes a magnet, and it's a it's a it's it's a, and we see it as starting with nodes that start to grow together, and uh, in our fantasy, of course, then it becomes a continual line of <laughs> social and economic and cultural activity. But coming way back down to Earth, in a remote part of our Earth, in uh, Bhutan, uh, which is in the Himalayas, um, 
we were invited to, to and th this is a, a typical village, a uh, typical sort of clustering. Um, we were invited to, and uh, where people live very simply, um, in architecture that has, well, there's an oral tradition that is preserved. The local architects are actually foreign trained. And when it comes to the most important buildings in Bhutan, are not that involved. It's left to the master builders. Um, and, and buildings of this sort are actually done by the farmers. And they will gather together and help each other build a house when one's necessary. Um, but our particular, um, uh, yeah. <laughs> We all love reggae. <laughs> yeah. And um, so they, they actually have very clumsy ways of prefab and construction. So we thought we're not going to give them a new language, international style to Bhutan. Uh, it's better to really work with their idiom, but improve the, the production, make, make incremental changes, but most importantly, bring what we know is an improved way of life that, uh, that, that they will embrace, yeah. which and is uh, better. Uh, well, this particular project is um, it's for <coughs> elder monks who uh, traditionally have gone back to their home villages, which they probably left as young children. And you know, large families would be able to take them in, care for them in their old age. And, you know, in, in Bhutan and elsewhere, there's, there is migration to the cities, there's social change quite often. Uh, they don't have these families to return to. Um, and it's starting to become a, a real problem. And even when they did return, the, the, the house that you saw earlier, that's a three-story house, that's typical. The house is usually two or three stories, only animals on the ground floor. Uh, you reach your, your living space by a, a ship's ladder. And uh, when you're too old and infirm, you just stay home. Um, and so, of course, you quickly decline. Um, so for these elder monks, the idea was to, working, as Calvin said, with their idiom, um, to do a major shift, which is to live on one floor, on the ground floor, completely accessible, uh, so that one can age in place with, um, with, as well as one could in, in any place designed with ADA standards anywhere in the world. Um, and, um, but we clustered the building so that there's yeah. actually a relational uh, condition that ins yeah. that's inscribed into the plan. Right. So younger monks, was, uh, two younger monks would support four elder monks. And then when they're really old, they go into a communal uh, building here that, that's kind of, uh, that then everyone collectively uh, uh, serve them. So they're very independent. They are fiercely independent. Yeah. We want to maintain their independence way into old age. Yeah. Um, the, and the, I think that's one of the most yeah. important things. Yeah, exactly. The, these are you know, houses for six or eight um, where they will live communally until they are too old. And, and as Calvin said, yes, there is, if they are sick and they need to go to the hospital, basically, there's a place here in their community center where they can go and hopefully return to their houses. Um, and these are, the, there is hierarchy within the Buddhist structure in Bhutan. These are for the most senior elder monks who are assisted. Uh, in each case, there are younger ones who are living with them to assist. And a, a temple that will be done by others. And um, Well, I think one thing that we want to mention is when we selected the site, we particularly uh, took care to situate it near a a elementary school. Yeah. So we believe that el that inter the, when the elderly and the young meet, there's a kind of energy that cannot be uh, underestimated. And, and so call it social engineering, if you will, but we feel that there are times when that kind of uh, process, uh, consideration would be worthwhile. Um, Anything more you want to add on that? Mm, not really. I mean, we um, there's just some progress. We, we're in the process. Just finished the first building, which is a kind of test. Um, is this some construction photos? Um, and 
So one thing that we did uh, alter is that we created a translucency in the roof, so allow sunlight to go into the, the darkest part of the, their kind of architectural type. Um, that's probably the one, in, one transformation the one. that we yeah. made. Otherwise, the architectural idiom is very much theirs. Uh, and here is the monk blessing the prototype. Um, this is the first one built, and then we are going to refine it, and uh, both in construction methodology as well as some of the spatial and formal uh, uh, moves. Now, uh, going back out again to the urban context, this is the project in Singapore. Uh, this is actually an old project done about 15 years ago. Um, and that was a time when, uh, in here, uh, in contrast to Bhutan, where it's a very monolithic culture, this is a city of immigrants. Uh, it's a very t young country, Singapore, and it's, the population is made of equal parts Chinese, Indians, and Malays. And I would say that uh, socially, they're not always integrated. Uh, and we want to use this building, uh, a set of buildings, and that's a very large scale uh, master plan and construction of um, workspaces and exhibition and con conference spaces. Um, the programs derive from a particular need in that time of their development where they are at a crossroads and they couldn't. Uh, they were in a sort of production culture uh, in uh, based in this, um, economics economy, but cannot compete with the other less uh, 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 other labor forces uh, in neighboring neighboring countries, and they're trying to evolve into a service based economy, and we're actually again uh, work with their government agencies, uh, the Economic Development Board, the Tourist Promotion Board, and try to take stock of what the direction they had. And the conclusion after kind of moderating those different agencies and being the kind of bridge purse uh, entity, we guided them into its conclusion that a convention and center and a new business center, a commercial office center, would be the right thing to do, giving them a, uh, at that time, a, uh, uh, the, the, the best grade of office buildings. Now, we actually helped them locate the site because um, we, this is a landfill site, and it just happens to be in the, the intersection of the existing commercial corridor, the, re the shopping and other social activities, this is the airport, and this is what they call the East Coast Parkway that kind of leads like that, and it goes into town. It, it, circ it actually circumscribes the city, but it does deposit into this site, and then it connects to what a, a local highway that takes you to the, to the old existing commercial center, which is overbuilt, and they couldn't really restore, I mean, uh, resuscitate it. Uh, without tearing some of the building down and losing momentum in terms of continuity in their social development. So this is kind of a relief valve for this. So when, once we build this, they can start to tear some of the old buildings down and, re, and, and re, rebuild the, the existing commercial center. And so by locating this at the, the conference of these three arteries, we feel that this is a perfect uh, location for this uh, endeavor. Now, uh, logic aside, on the other front, we feel that, well, can we use this also as a way of unifying the three cultures by creating something that they call their own? And the one thing that we, we come across is the two symbols, the, the hand, Zach, which mm -hmm. is well, the, the, this is, this is a, a, a Buddha's hand, and, and it's, it has, of course, the meanings of mercy and, and, uh, and compassion. Um, it, the, there's, and embrace. Uh, well, the, there's a similar hand symbol that is um, 
that is very deeply held and respected by the, by the Muslims from Malay, Malaysia, <coughs> uh, which is the hand of, of Fatima, which is a protective hand. And, um, and of course, there, there's the, 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 the Christian hand of mercy, which is very similar. Uh, and th there is a large Christian population here, there, too. Um, so, so, go ahead. so combined with the mandala, which is a shared symbol and a methodology of organizing uh, their societies, and the symbol of a hand, uh, we created this configuration of the master plan, which is uh, five, five, five towers in representing a hand with a central space uh, th that it embraces. And this is the convention center. And then And this space, which uh, in sectionally allows both vehicular and pedestrians to, to cross over and penetrate this public space, also holds uh, this fountain, uh, which actually is a, has a symbolic meaning of wealth. And ringing the fountain are social, uh, act activities such as cafes and bars and restaurants. And so by day and by night, this becomes independent as, a, as, a, as an attraction uh, from the, the buildings around. Yeah. Water is, of course, life, life essence to the Indians and many other cultures and, and literally represents wealth to the Chinese. But we are trying to navigate and mitigate two scales. One, which is the existing low rise, and then the kind of pop-ups of these new buildings. This is actually the, fi the five towers, and so on the ground level, surrounding, the, surrounding these towers is a composition that embraces a lower scales of three stories and bringing the relationship to the, the low rise building across the street and then these buildings rise both from these, this three story datum as well as to the park uh, nearby and this three level um, zone is also uh, also acts as a portal to the compound and uh, and then within that we uh, create an interplay between exterior interior space where they interlock like puzzles and transparencies bringing the outside and inside out and hold a very constant theme of ours and of course, you can see these buildings on sort of quasi pilotes where the space uh, offers both shadow and light as well as kind of interlocking interior and exterior space. The, um, <coughs> that last slide, if you pick up that point, and this is the last project. Uh, the last slide is um, the, the entire site has uh, two levels of parking and and all, all services below ground. But the parking level is, you experience it like this, with penetrations down to that level of light and water and fountains, and um, which we, uh, so and, and, and here, this is actually the same level, that, that uh, first parking level. It's a network of cafes and restaurants that not only surround the, the, the fountain of plaza, but also connect back to all of the buildings and into the, uh, the subway, which didn't exist at that point, but does now. So amazingly, of course, this space, which actually this fountain was designed with a lighting system, and when it's turned off, it's meant to be a stage. Uh, we were really amazed that, that uh, the, the creative people in that community found amazing creative ways to use that fountain. They one dance company decided to, to keep the water on while doing the performance, and, uh, and it's... Actually, since then, it's become sort of a, for better or for worse, the Times Square of Singapore. Mm -hmm. And this, to me, is the most moving and satisfying image. This is a, a, a picture of a Sri Lankan worker. And I have to say that you know, his station in life is the most menial. He just did clean up post-construction on the site. And uh, this, side, this slide particularly has very resonance to me. I always get very emotional when I see this slide. 
because um, sometimes I think that you know what you want to write and you want validation, and this is the highest validation for me uh, and for us. Um, this poor man who's get paid a dollar ninety five a day uh, was cleaning up for weeks um, pre opening, and of course I was rushing back and forth, and we would cross paths and. And uh, we acknowledge each other's presence. And on that day when we finally opened the fountain, he was totally mesmerized. And uh, I said, oh, can I take a picture of you? I took this picture, and he turned on beam, and he goes, what? this is the most important uh, moment of his life because he was so proud to have worked on this project. You know? And so I, I, this just humbles me that, of course, I should be proud. But for him to be proud, you know, for me, if I could touch one person in my life, it's very gratifying. So I'm sorry. I just, just doesn't get to me every time. I should stop using this slide. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, some things cannot be described. I, I, we, the method of my madness. Um, and uh, I, I just think that this series of slides, better unsp uh, unexplained, might actually uh, share with you uh, more deeply what, what we're trying to do or be after. Thank you for your time. What? Oh, sure. Answer the question. Yes. So we, yeah. We'd be happy. It's I a mean, very long I know day. We, so. we were at
I think I wore them out. I think we, <laughs> yes. Yeah. 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 I'm never going to use that slide again. <laughs>